Wow. Such an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for those amazing and incredible words. And your heart, or, um, I trust that you have seen that there is more to ministry than just um, preaching and showing up here. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to be uh, obedient to what I felt God say to me this morning. And that is that uh, I believe that I heard God say that he has removed the lid from the church. And I'm not sure what that fully means, and that's oftentimes what God does. Uh, and somehow I, I, into the future, you will see more of that happen. Um, God speaks, and, and often we want it to be the next day or even immediate, but there is... Uh, a gestation period, but I do believe in this, that God has removed the lid, and um, I'm excited, excited to see what God's going to do in and through Anthem. So good to be here post-COVID or post, I mean, um, you guys, I didn't, I didn't get the memo of no masks. Um, uh, it's, it's obviously a KZN thing. Is it a KZN? The CA, is that it? That's brilliant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm moving to KZN, that's for sure. I've been telling my, my, the church is that I want to start a movement, let's burn the mask parade or something, you know. You guys have done it, so, but, so um, yeah. Um, Paul writes in Thessalonians, uh, to the Thessalonians, and he says, overwhelm your leaders with appreciation. And that's really what... And, you know, I wanted to do this morning is just overwhelm you with appreciation. And uh, would you do that often? I know it's tough, but sometimes somebody steal the mic, put this beautiful couple up here and just overwhelm them with appreciation. Um, if, uh, you can, if they allow you to do that, do it. If they don't allow you to do it, do it. Just say the Bible says I can, all right? So... You know that God card one? You know, just like God says. <laughs> On the 22nd of July, I woke up very early in the morning, and I had the sense that God was speaking to me. I got up, and I went to my office, and I began to, to journal. And God began to speak these words to me that it's a new day, it's a new beginning. And there were some things which tumbled out of uh, what I now believe in and know that it was the Spirit of God speaking. But there was this other sense that God was going to take my mom home. And she had got COVID. She was 92, as Andy said. Uh, exquisite, unbelievable, awesome mom. Last in her generation. And she was sprightly. She was still driving a car at 92. I mean, fortunately, it was in PE and no one, and we weren't around. But um, as sharp as anything, she had phoned a, a couple of uh, three or four days beforehand and was, um, you know, on FaceTime. And that morning, I just, it was, you're going to take mom today. And of course, as a son, and that, you don't want that to happen, you know, it's kind of like, anyway, I, 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 Continued to journal, and I wrote some things out, and, and then I had a phone call from my insurance broker around some things, and he knows my mom, and he said, okay, but first, Craig, how's your mom? And I said, you know, Tim, I, I kind of got the sense that this is what God said to me. It's a new day. It's a new beginning. So either God is going to heal my mom today, or he's going to take her home, and I think he's taking her home. And that's a very strange thing to do and say, you know, but uh, about an hour later, my sister phoned me and says, Mom's gone home. And of course, Rich and Jackie came up. That was, you know, we were busy doing the memorial and in walks Rich and Jackie. And it's of course in those moments that you are grieving and you're sad, and yet we were celebrating. She was a beautiful woman, amazing mother. I mean, I remember talking to her and, uh, at her 90th, a birthday, I flew down to be with her that morning, 
And she said, Craig, I, you know, I've got to go because I've got to go to look after an old deer. <laughs> I said, Mom, how old is the old deer? She said, oh, she's about 80-something. <laughs> so I think she was, though she was 90, she felt 70 or maybe 60. But what I realized in that moment that God gave me a sign and a wonder. He had told me that he was going to take her so that I would go back to the word that he spoke to me. And so that's about eight or so months ago. And this is some of my journaling. And it says, Craig, you know that I love new beginnings. This is a new day for new beginnings. This is the time has come. Things are changing from today. It's a day of grace when grace triumphs over evil. It's a new day, a new beginning, and the word of the Lord is hovering over the earth. To those who would let it settle upon them, they would be watered, drenched by the dew of my word, bringing life, fruitfulness, reversing the fortunes, bringing godly authority and great honor. And then it's, this came out of like left field, because it says, tell my people to get ready, to position themselves for change, to position themselves for spiritual growth. So I'm telling God's people, get ready, position yourselves for change, position yourselves for spiritual growth. I don't fully know what all of that really means as God speaks, but I am grappling with it. And so I trust that, Father, this morning, that you would help me and that you would bring a revelation of your word which would settle upon your people. And the word of grace and your grace filled word would settle upon your people like dew and water them, bringing forth the harvest that you intend in each one of us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you know what this is? It's a big pen. You know that before the ballpoint pen, there was the fountain pen. And before the fountain pen, there was a quill. And before the quill, it was a reed. <laughs> um, now, things weren't always that way, but in, in the late 1800s, there was a inventor that invented a pen that could, that had a tiny little metal ball in a socket with ink above it. And it, it, it was innovative, didn't really take off, could write on some things, but kind of uh, the norm of the day was really everybody wrote with a fountain pen. But what happened is, is that in in the 1940s, there were two French brothers that had fled, uh, sorry, um, yeah, uh, German brothers that had fled to, to Argentina because of the war. They were Jewish, uh, from Jewish descent, and one was a, uh, a, a journalist, and the other was a chemist. And so what happened was he, one day at the printing press, was thinking about how this printing press was working and the ink was drying very quickly. So what he did is he thought about how he could actually make a pen with quick drying ink. And these two brothers came up with a chemical formula and they really reinvented what we now know as a ballpoint pen. It was so innovative in those days that the Royal Air Force during the army, ordered 30,000 of them because these ballpoint pens could write at altitudes that fountain pens couldn't. After the war, some Americans got hold of this invention and they marketed the very first ballpoint pen. Now, you know, at that time, it, it was a very costly uh, uh, item. But the, on the first weekend of launch, they sold, in the first week, they sold out 30,000 of them. 
and at the cost of what I worked out was 5% of their salary of the day. So take your salary and take 5% of that. That's what the cost of the first ballpoint pens were. It's quite expensive. But it wasn't until later on in the late 1940s that a Frenchman called Marcel Bich decided that he in the, was going to take with this new uh, inventions of plastic that he would take a see-through plastic, put a, a ballpoint pen in it and make it very cheap. He put a hole in to, to equalize the pressure. He made it clear so that you could see how much ink was in it. And the ink could last two years. And he made it for a dollar. And today, 20 million big pens are sold every day. There's billions of big pens. And of course, what we have now is, in fact, many say that education in Africa has literally been transformed by the big pen. This one cost me 7 rand 50, which is about 50 cents of the dollar around about, okay? And there are so many plastic big pens or plastic pens going into landfills that they now have started to make echo pens. This one cost me three rand fifty. It's made out of cardboard. You see, when Jesus was ministering here on earth and he, he came to a time and a place where he was eating and partying, some said, with some Sinners. And the Pharisees of the day hated it. They couldn't take the fact that Jesus was eating and drinking with those that they would not be with. And in fact, it was probably at a time when the Pharisees were fasting. And you see, the Pharisees or the legalists of that day, they would fast sometimes twice a week. And so it was likely, some commentators say, that on one of those days, when the Pharisees were fasting, Jesus and his disciples were eating and having a great time. And the Pharisees came along and going like, why can you do that and we can't? Okay? And that's what legalists do. And so here they're trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus answers them with a parable. You know what a parable is? It's a story that or a parallel that brings about a heavenly truth into a, a very world situation. And so Jesus says this. He says, hey guys, you can't put new wine in an old wineskin. What you've got to do is you've got to put new wine in a new wineskin. And the thing that fascinated me for the first time as I looked at this again was that when Jesus said that, he used two different words to describe the word new wine and new wineskin. So if I had to say it like this, using Greek, and I'm not Greek, but just so that you understand, it's like this. He said, you cannot put neos wine in a kainos wineskin. The problem with our English translation is we only have one word for those two different words. So we have the word new for new wine, and you for kainos one. But there is a slight difference. And neos actually is new, but will become quickly old. Where kainos is a new state of an unprecedented quality. It's still the same thing, but it's of an unprecedented new quality. So he says, you can't put New, you, you must put new wine, neos. Let, let me give you, neos would be, how many of you like fresh bread? Yeah. Anybody love fresh bread? I tell you, Annie and I found a place that makes this ciabatta in a pizza oven the other day. It's 50 rand a loaf, but I'll drive 50 k's just to buy it. <laughs> it's fresh, warm, ooh, okay. So <clears throat> the reality is, is that tomorrow that bread is stale, it's old. So the neos wine is something new but quickly goes old. When you pour it out, it is already going stale. 
Whereas a kainos new is of something that is of a new state, an unprecedented quality that's not known before. When they invented the big pen in Marcel Bich, I'm sure he didn't realize what would happen from putting ink in a tube that people could see and write and make it into the masses. It was still a writing instrument, but it was a kainos instrument. You see, when it comes to the church, and when Isaiah prophesies, and he says of God saying, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. He uses a Hebrew word which is equivalent to the Greek kainos. So it would be like this. God says, behold, I'm doing a kainos thing. Do you not perceive it as it springs forth? See, God loves new beginnings and God is doing a new thing. God is doing a kainos thing. It's still the church. Nothing's going to change. You see, people try and change the church. No, it's the church But God is bringing the church into a kainos, unprecedented state. That's the new beginning. That's the new thing. Now, you're going to say, Craig, what is this new thing? Well, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm being obedient to proclaiming to the church is get ready. Get ready and position yourself for change. Now, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because... You are already in a repositioning. But I want to come as a voice and encourage you to continue to position yourself for change. Winston Churchill said this, and our architect friend here who's sitting in the front should be able to quote this better than me. But he says this, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. I want to say is that we build our buildings and then our buildings build us. We, we fill our buildings and then our buildings fill us. If Acts 2, as I said, is, is that the Holy Spirit came and filled the building and then filled us, our, our vision and our heart should be a lot more not around me, please fill me, but Come and fill the space because then every one of us will be filled. You see, the kingdom of God is never just about me, but it's about us and our togetherness. So we look at a church as beautiful as you, as courageous, as responsive as you, as passionate as you. And you see that as you have stepping out, because actually you are not shaping. You know what I love about coming to Anthem? Is that there's always something new around, something they've done. You've kind of, you know, you're changing. You're positioning yourself for change. Many people live on this premise, is that give me and then I will. How many of you want to be more generous? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you can be courageous. Can you put up your hands in this church? Yeah. So how many of you want to be more generous? Brilliant. So why aren't you more generous? I mean, the reality of that is just that to be more generous is you just have to be more generous. But what we ask for many times, come on, let's be honest here, is that we say, Lord, give me more and I will give more. And we're waiting waiting for God to give us more so that we can give more. And God's waiting for us to give more so that He can give more. And so this is the thing. It's, It's not about... positioning for change is taking the step of faith to move into that space. Oh God, what have I done? And you are a church, you are people that are doing that. I believe that God is doing a kainos thing with his church. It's still the church, but it's a kainos wineskin that receives a neos wine So we are to prepare this kainos church to receive the fresh new wine outpouring of the Spirit of God. Our kainos structure, this new church, is to be of a superior quality, extraordinary, unprecedented, never seen or done before. Come on. Anthem, what about it? Rich spoke last night about being a people that are symbolic of things to come. And that's what it is. It's this prophetic heart of being a people that rush into the future. You see the future. 
you then run back and you become the future, this grace personified, like we heard on Friday night, that it's not just about receiving grace, but being the product of grace. So a prophetic per- people, a church, is one that rushes into the future, and like our friends up the road, Dylan Yannick, he says, what do you see when you close your eyes and open your heart? We'll never see the future with our open eyes. We'll only see it with an open heart. So we run into this presence of God and we see, you open this conference, you open the the, the, the meetings with, what do you see? So I'm asking you, when you close your eyes, what do you see? Because as we see that, then we can come back into the present and we have to become it. It's not just good enough for Richard and Jackie or the elders. It's not, that's not going to make it. This is a people that have all got to cross over. See, God calls us to multiple crossings over. When Jesus or his disciples, he showed how they had to cross over the lake multiple times. There is this crossing into greater territory. There is this growing spiritually. But yet... Our nature is to settle. Our nature is to camp. But you aren't that. You're a people that are courageous, symbolic of things to come, so that others can come and look and go, wow, we want to do that. There's not many that God calls to be symbolic of things to come. There's not many. What I've found is is actually very few. You're crossing over, and I know that's also in a physical sense. I think there's a highway between here and where you're going. But it's not so much that you're crossing over a physical thing, though I think when we look at Scriptures, we see it. Like Joshua, when he was called to cross over the Jordan to take the people of God into the Promised Land, there was massive change coming. For 40 years, they'd lived with a cloud to protect them in the day. They'd lived with fire to give them uh, heat at night. They'd lived with manna every morning. All they did was, you know, walk out their, their tent in the morning and open the tent, and there it was, manna. And the first day that it came, how many of you ladies would love to know that's all you've got to cook for the next 40 years? <clears throat> you kind of walk out your tent in the morning. The first time it happened, they walked out there, everyone and said, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Everybody is like the whole camp just started to sing. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? They got like, and so they actually named this food. What is it? It's true. The word manna means what is it? <laughs> actually, you're laughing. If some of you would just get into the word every morning and go, what is it? You would grow. Sorry, let me take that back a little bit. Like, that was too exact. Mate, let me encourage you to go out in the morning and ask God, what is it? You will grow. <laughs> and the thing is, they didn't know that the manna was going to stop, the clouds were going to disappear. What they heard was their obedience to put their feet in the water to cross over into the promised land. They'd lived in a miracle, I think I've shared this before, haven't I? That, we've, that the Israelites lived in a land of miracles, but they were crossing over into a miraculous land. You see, very many, a lot of us actually love the fact that they want miracles. And you know, you go, oh, Greg, you've got to have more miracles. Just pray in the name of Jesus. And it's really good. And we need miracles. I want, but I just don't want to live in, in a land of miracles. I want to live in a miraculous land. So you've got to cross over. You've got to go to that. You see, the manna was, dis- was, was going to go. So on the other side of the river, on the other side of the crossing, was that they would sow and reap. Or they were going to reap first and then sow. If you read Joshua chapter 3, and it says there, there's like in the brackets, it says, it says, when they got to this river, it was during harvest time, first clue. And the second thing it says is that the river flooded through the entire harvest time. Three months. Okay? So, it's like if you've been with the Israelites for 40 years, 
You know, you'd be in one of them. You'd watch that river go up and down. Is that, you know, for eight months of the year, maybe, maybe more, nine months of the year, you could literally, and then I've been there, you can actually just, and you're across the Jordan. But for four months of the year, or three at least, it flooded. So when Joshua says, guys, we're going across, and they're looking at this flooding river, and they're going, you know what, Josh, I've watched this for 40 years. If we just wait, we can just walk across. It's actually not convenient now. You know what I've learned? Is that God never calls us to convenience. In fact, most times, people go like, oh, I think things are just lining up. and it's No, no, that's probably not God. Because God, t- I'm serious. There's how many times have you heard somebody go like, there's a massive challenge in my way. I'm believing God to cross over. Most people go, oh, that's such a challenge. No, I'll just go around it. You see, we live in this land of comfortable miracles Manna every morning, but God has so much more for us. He's wanting us to live in a miraculous land, but there is going to be hard work where we sow and reap. And so into that circumstance, God says, cross over. He says, get ready. You're going to go over. He says, and away you go. You go and read chapter 3 of Joshua and ask God, what is it? Just ask God, Lord, in this season, what is it that I've got to do? How do I get ready to position myself for change? You see, they went and stood in the flooding river, and it stopped way up the river in a place called Adam. It must have taken a long time for the water to actually dissipate and stop before they could actually go over. But we live in this instant world where we put our foot in a river, and in Jesus' name, it didn't work. And God says, hang on, stop the river. But it's way up. You can't see it. He says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? So you stand in the flooding river, but I'm perceiving God. You're doing a new thing. When will I cross? I don't know, but it is stopping. I wonder what happened in those first times when, they, when the people of Israel who were standing in the river started to actually go, guys, I think it's stopping. It's getting less. Hey, something's happening. I think that God sent me here today to say to you, hey, I think it's happening. Some people are, you know, like a disbelief. Is it? I'm saying, it is. So you say, Craig, what's on the other side of the river? Can I get some water? My water, please, sorry. What's on the other side of the river? What's on, thank you. What's on the other side of... um, McCurtain, McCurtain, how do you say it? Is that what you call this place? And you go like, Cornubia, what is it, what is it, what is it? You know, and you go, what's on the other side? I want to tell you what's on the other side is grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Now, I love this text. We actually celebrated it for our 25th. Grace upon grace. I found out actually that that word, upon can be said and then translated to grace instead of grace. So grace instead of grace. So you're like, what do you mean, Lord? So here's the deal. If you're staring at a river and there's water going past, okay? You all there? Okay, that, that river that you love, it's running. Okay, you're staring. Remember, now you're staring at it. And you stare at it for one minute, and the water's rushing past, okay? Is it the same water that you're staring at one minute later? No. What's happened? It's still water, but it's water instead of water. So grace upon grace is grace, but there's grace instead of grace now. There's always grace. There's water. There's grace. But it's grace instead of grace. So one commentator said this. I'm telling you, this is going to help you. Watch it. It says, in Christ, we find grace instead of grace. Is it coming up there? Brilliant. It says, the different ages and the different situations in life demand a different kind of grace. We need one grace in the days of prosperity and another in the days of adversity. We need one grace in the sunlit days of youth and another, I'm finding out, when the shadows of age begin to enter. Stop laughing. You must be younger than me. 
The church needs one grace in the days of persecution and another in the days of acceptance have come. We need one grace when we feel that we are on top of things and another when we are depressed and discouraged and near to despair. We need one grace to bear our own burdens and another to bear one another's burdens. We need one grace when we are sure of things and another when there seems nothing certain left in this world. The grace of God is never static but always dynamic. It never fails to meet a situation. One, needs, one need invades life and one grace comes with it. That need passes and another need assaults us. And with another grace, it comes. That through life, we are constantly receiving grace instead of grace. For the grace of Jesus Christ is triumphantly adequate to deal with every situation. I've been so encouraged by Acts chapter 17. And God took me there recently as Paul was on his journey. And, and you know, he, he's just come out of Philippi. Let me give you a quick context and then we'll go to Acts 17. He, he's, he's been in, in Philippi. How many of you know what happened in Philippi? Come on, all you Bible scholars and students. Come on, tell me what happened in Philippi. I mean, come on. This, this is not a test. This is not, you're not going to fail. You're not going to get kicked out of church. I promise you. Maybe you will. I don't know. Okay, what happened in Philippi? Philippi, Paul and Silas went into jail. They were put in stocks. They began to praise. Remember, there was an earthquake, and the whole jail got saved. Yes? You remember that story? I mean, he was persecuted. He was beaten. So, I mean, you can imagine now, Paul and Silas, they've been beaten. They have got scabs, blood, and it's, you know, and they chased away, and this is what happens, is that they're on this journey, and they've been persecuted, and God has given them grace the supernatural enabling power. This is how I say what grace means. You probably got your own version. And many people say grace equals God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how I was taught it. It's, um, it is that. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Have you never heard that before? Yeah, I'm sure you have. Okay. See, all the old people are going this. The young people are going, huh? <laughs> how do you spell geography? I mean, as a dyslexic at school, it's like geography. How do you spell science? Anybody can spell science? I mean, English is like this. So how did I learn how to spell science? Silly cats in England never catch elephants. <laughs> I'm a dyslexic. Sorry. I mean, it's like I put P's and D's and Q's and upside down. So how did I learn? Gregory eats old gray rats and paints houses yellow. Geography. <laughs> you see, I learned that. Uh, oh, anyway, so grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a simple way, but here it is. For me, grace is the supernatural enabling power that comes from heaven, enabling me to do, nat to do supernaturally what I can't do naturally. Super Mario. I've preached Super Mario, yeah? I've never preached Super Mario. Not here? You'll have to invite me back to preach Super Mario. All you young people. Don't get me distracted now. My wife's normally telling me, don't get distracted. Now she's distracting me. But the supernatural enabling power, the influence of heaven that comes upon my soul, enabling me to do supernaturally what I can't do naturally. So I could never get saved naturally. So I need a supernatural enabling power to do that. So grace, I am saved because the supernatural power of Christ comes upon me in my soul and enables me to be saved because I couldn't do it naturally. But grace is not a, just a once-off. Remember, they say that grace is like a swimming pool. Salvation is like a swimming pool. It's, it's not just the diving board. It's a swimming pool. Grace, we need grace to live life. So we get saved by grace. But then we need grace instead of grace, instead of grace, instead of grace. So all through life we are receiving the grace, the grace, the grace. Yeah? All right. Let me get to Thessalonians. Oh no, Acts chapter. Acts chapter 17. So Paul has had this grace in Philippi, and um, he's been, they've been beaten, they've been chased out, 
And it says, and now when they had passed through. Say pass through. You are passing through. Anthem, you're crossing over. You're passing through. God, no, I don't want to go. They're like, imagine if you were born of the Israelites going like, I don't want to go across the Jordan. But it says they all went. And this is the thing. He said, for all of us, I don't know. I am sure that some said, you know what? I've been here for 40 years. I don't want to move. But I'm going, we together have to bring revelation to one another and help everyone find the grace to cross over. We have to find, help everyone find the grace because grace is found. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Give me back Super Mario. All right. Um, to find the grace so that we can pass through. And so here, yeah, he's got this grace. Pass through, pass through. But then he comes passing through Amphipolis, Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was on the converge of two major uh, trade routes. It was a walled city. They come there, and where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and there were three Sabbaths that he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. This was the opening that, that Paul had. He had a door of opening into a synagogue. And so he'd go and preach the gospel in the synagogue. And he says this. Explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and did great many of the devout Greeks and, and not a few of the leading women, meaning a lot of the leading women of the day. But the Jews were jealous and taking some of the wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, attacked the house of Jason where they were staying, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of his brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down! So I'm sorry, Anthem. I'm just going to swap caps. My message this morning, Anthem! Turn the world upside down. Now, you know, we kind of often kind of think like, hey, just turn the world upside down. I don't know if you've seen on the end, you'll see some cute little pictures of the world upside down. You know, one of those, what do you think, those shaky things that, what do you call them? Snow globes, you know. Oh, it's so pretty, you know. i tell you what was happening here. This was an uproar. If you could imagine right now in this war zone and in, in the flight of the Ukrainians and the difficulties of the, and the desperation, there was this they were, they were rioting. They were, they were ready to, they, they wanted blood. And here was this uproar. And this is what they were saying of Paul and Silas. This is what they're saying. These men have turned the world upside down. And I wonder what the world would say of the church today. <laughs> the church is the turning the world upside down. And I've got to go, you know, I want to grapple with that. And we can be radical and we can do all those things. Or we can find out just how Paul got that response. And the only way that I know is because I'm going, what did Paul preach in three weeks? He had three Sabbaths. He comes to Thessalonica. He's got three Sabbaths. He proclaims Christ. And let's say he stays on a little bit longer. But there was this riot and they chase him away. So I don't know. The likelihood is that it's, let's give him six weeks. Let's give him two months there. I don't think it was long as that. Some people say it's only three. And then he got chased out. And some go, it probably was a little bit longer. I don't know. But we know that it was short. How did his preach? What did he do? What did he preach that turned the world upside down? Well, don't you ask that question. <laughs> what is it? Because <laughs> when I read that and God stopped me, these men turned the world upside down. I go, God, I want to be someone who turns the world upside down. But how do we do that? What do we preach? What is it? And I go, what is it? What is it? So I went to the book of Thessalonians. So we can turn there quickly. And this is Paul. He's now been chased away. He's now 
writes a letter back to them. It's some time later. So give it a year or two or so. And this is how he describes them. And in chapter 1, he's just writing to them. He's greeting them and he's telling them. He says, man, I'm so excited about what God's doing in you and through you. It's like Anthem. God, he said, he's, God's taking the lid off. And uh, it's like I, a couple of months later, I'm going to write back to you and go, wow, I've heard that what God has done through you by his grace upon grace is that now the entire area has heard about Jesus and his grace. Okay, that's what he says in the beginning. He says, this is it. And then he describes to them actually what he did, chapter 2. He says, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But, through, but though we already suffered and had been shamefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. There's a lot of conflict and chaos right now. And our appeal does not spring from error or impunity, impurity, sorry, or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with this gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never, come with empty, we never came with empty words of flattery, as you know, with the pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though, good evening, good morning, hello. Though we could have made demands, if it's God, please just uh, put him through otherwise. <laughs> nor did we seek the glory from people whilst you, we were with you from others, nor Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil, we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Is anybody hearing something that's going again and again? You got it? That's the third time, the gospel of God. Your witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into this kingdom of glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that you have received the word of God, which you heard from us, accepted it, not as a word of man, but what it really was, the word of God which is at work in you as believers. Oopsie, this is a bit small now. So this is what I'll say. This is not a pep talk. This is not a TED talk. This is not a motivational talk. This is what I believe is an apostolic word to help ready you for what's to come. If you want to be a church that's symbolic of things to come, that turns the world upside down, then these are some of the things that I see that Paul, the apostle, did. And I want to encourage you to be a people that do the same. The first thing that he did was this. He boldly declared the gospel. So it says there, he says, man, to declare to you the gospel of God. Now, when you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says it's the gospel of grace or the grace of God. So I want to tell you is that I want to say boldly declare the gospel of grace. Okay? So Paul, when he says that the gospel of God, what he's saying is, and if you look at Acts 20, 24, when he went, he proclaimed the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God. So I want to ask you, to be a people that boldly declare the grace, the gospel of grace. I tell you, last night was an outstanding example. Sorry, Rich. I know you preached, but your wife, she was phenomenal in giving us a glimpse on how to take the most difficult text in all of Scripture and bring the gospel with it. It's like we did Judges recently, and we just skipped that chapter. It's like, uh-uh. And she dived into it and gave the gospel of grace. So you, you're well on your way there. When the gospel is preached and believed, stuff happens. 
When the gospel is preached and believed, stuff happens. The world is turned upside down. Slaves and sinners become sons. And people of influence find their purpose. So you want to know, it's like people are lost. To me, there's three big issues right now in our world that people are grappling with. Purpose, protection, and provision. If I had to ask you, what are you praying mostly for now? God, protect me, provide for me, and what am I going to do tomorrow? <laughs> Is that true? I think there's other things, but I think those big three are some of the big threes that we face right now. So when people are battling with their purpose, proclaim the gospel. Number two, be a people that please God and not man. Paul says this. He says, man, we came there. He says, I didn't come there preaching to please man. My, my, don't worry about what man thinks. Worry about what God thinks. Paul, he writes this. He says, find out to the Ephesians, I think it is. Yes, he says, find out what pleases God. Do you know what pleases God? Have you ever found out what pleases God? What is it? Maybe tomorrow morning you just go, okay, what is it? What pleases God? That's a great manner kind of forage. Okay? Before you get to sowing and reaping here, before we're going to have to get into the deep things of theology, let's learn to be those that are faithful with just the what is it, the manner. Let's just go out in the morning and go, okay, Lord, what is it that pleases you? And when you, you know why you need to find out what pleases God? Let me give you some of the benefits. I'll tell you why you're going to find the what. Because if I give you the what, you won't do it. I don't know if you'll do it anyway. How many of you are going to go find out what pleases God? Come on. So here it is. You want to grow spiritually. You want to put yourself in a position of growth. Find out what pleases God. These are some of the benefits. When we please God, you'll find this. Our prayers are answered. How many need your prayers answered? Just please God. Um, he'll fill you with wisdom and knowledge by pleasing God. And you'll be strengthened with joy and peace and you'll possess your inheritance. Those are just some of the benefits of pleasing God. So if we want to be a people that are full of that, then we just go and find out what pleases God and begin to do that. Number three, Paul says, he was gentle, humble, and he always honored. Paul uses this image of childlike. He says, we were like children amongst you. We just humbled ourselves. This is a humble household. I love it. And, and it's that when, we, when we're weak, we actually find the grace of God, don't we? Because grace is manifested in strength. No, it's manifested in weakness, isn't it? So we become powerful. That's what Paul says. He says, grace has made me sufficient because not of my strength but my weakness. So it's, don't worry about being the best and the most strongest. Just let's be childlike, humble. Then he says, he imparted his life and his soul. He poured himself out. He, he didn't just preach the gospel, but he imparted his life and soul. He gave everything. He says, I was ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become so very dear to us. I'm going, three weeks? Six weeks? Takes me a few more years to, for people to become very dear to me. Maybe eight years. No, no, no. It was longer than <laughs> How long does it take for people to become so dear to us? And, and he says, I was like a mother who sharing her milk with newborns and protecting them. You know, he said, I was like a mother. You look at my, our daughter's just had her third daughter, like a couple of months. And, and, and you take this baby, for those of you who are in that, and he loves those little ones. I'm a little bit like that, too floppy and... You know, give them to me when they can kick and run and, and run a ball, you know, then we, we're friends. But this, like, I take this little baby and lock down that little floppy and, you know, and I watch my, my daughter. She'll protect with her life. 
She gives of her own self. She'll feed her. Like, oh, Lord, how do we do that? He says, that's how we did it. In, in a couple of weeks. So, you know, what comes to me is this. How many times do we actually think that revival can, and, and turning the world upside down could it'll take years? It's like we've got this thing. Oh, how long will it take, you know? How, can, how long can it take to change this nation? It's like it's been so many years of neglect, and it's just, it's terrible. And how are we ever going to change? It's going to take years. How about turning the world upside down in a couple of weeks? How much could we just believe? It's like, oh, Lord, maybe this could happen in a couple of weeks. And he says, I worked hard night and day. So this is what he did. He worked hard and he loved people. So we can love people, but we also got to work hard. For those of you who are lazy, is that we've got to learn to work hard. And for those of you who don't love people like me, we've got to, work, we've got to love people and work hard. I work hard, but I find it difficult to love people, especially the strange ones. It's like that's Andy's job. So no, no. <laughs> love people, work hard. He goes, here yeah, he talks about how he worked night and day to support himself. But he says, it was like a father. Because of love, he exhorted and encouraged and charged them. He exhorted them, encouraged them, and charged them. So here it is. Someone has said this. Exhortation gets people to do something willingly. Okay? Encouragement gets people to do things joyfully. But charging or challenging them gets people to not look back. So I reckon the first two are pretty easy. It's like how we get the volunteers together. Hey, in the morning, come on, let's do it. We're going to do this thing. Hey, we need volunteers. We're going to be out there. We're going to do um, bacon and egg rolls, and we're going to have coffee. And the people will go like, whoa. So there's this exhortation, and we all arrive, and we're going to do this thing. Yes, we're going to do it willingly. And then John says, listen, guys, not just to do it willingly, but let's put a smile on our face. Let's do it joyfully. We're here to do it. We go, yeah. But if we're not challenged, we'll do it for a week, two, three, maybe a year, and then we look back and say, oh, I've done that. I wonder if COVID hasn't put us into a place where we need some challenging, kind of let something settle. Uh, I don't volunteer anymore. I think that one of the things that I hear from pastors around is one of the hardest things is we don't have the volunteers we had pre-COVID. So I'm challenging you now. Don't look back. Don't be a people that look back. Come on. You've got to be a people that are going forward, that are crossing over. We are passing through. Oopsie. Amen. I've got to say amen now. Then he says, yo, get the worship team up. Number six, he said, thank God constantly. That's what he said. He had constant gratefulness. Look, so you know what for me, constant gratefulness is this, is we walk forward, if that's forward, we walk forward looking backwards. Look what God's done. Look what God's done. That's grateful. It's like we're walking forward, but we're looking back. Look what God's done. Because we are a people that don't walk because of what we see. We, look, we walk because of what we see. And the last thing is he says, preach the word of God. He says, we preached. Here there was lever, revelation leads to wisdom, and the wisdom of God is a person, and his name is Jesus. Wisdom shows us how to live. Preach how to live, how to live, how to turn this world upside down. You know what? I think the most fearful thing to the enemy of heaven is the thought that normal folks like you and me actually believe the word of God and do it. I think that will terrify the enemy. We can sing and we need to. Lion, you know, Judah. And it's good. And that kind of gives us courage. But the devil will flee from us when we actually believe what the word says and we do it. <laughs> and I'm all for this, you know, let's, let's shout and let's. But if we don't back it with obedience, it's not going to turn the world upside down. So come on, stand church this morning.
I want to do a declaration. I do, do you have worship? Did they come up? They're not coming up. They don't come up. Oh, they don't. Oh, we don't play that. Okay, sorry. I should have asked you. I want to declare this over Anthem. And this is my old school. My father comes to mind. As whenever he prayed and declared, he would take his hat off. So I'm just going to take my hat off now. May this church be ready to position themselves for change. May this church grow spiritually to cross over to the promises that are more than before. May this church be bold in declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may this church please God and see their prayers answered. To be full of wisdom, knowledge, strengthened with joy and peace and possess their full inheritance. May this church receive grace enabling power as they walk gently, humbly and worthy of God. May this church be heart and soul people that hold nothing back. May this church work hard and love people through exhortation, encouragement, and challenging everyone to not look back. May this church walk forward, looking backward, always being grateful for what God has done. May this church preach the word of God in season and out of season. And may revelation produce wisdom to live lives that will turn the world upside.